Okay, let's get going. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed for letting me um, talk. And it's um, quite a privilege because you've got some fascinating people within your community. Um, just for context, um, I'm a designer. Let me just turn the volume down. I, I work with colleagues um, um, at the University of Edinburgh. Excuse if this makes you feel seasick. Um, it's just a sense that, and it was shot during lockdown, so there's no humans. You might see one. But really, we, we're blessed with a gallery, um, which we also use for co-creation workshops workshops we have a, a big student space which um affords lots of physical making even social distancing um and we have a you know we're able to build some quite unusual things which is something really important i think that i'll perhaps introduce the idea that making remains important within what we might call the archive so all this tech but really it's about craft people as well and it's about thinking about responsible research in the context of the digital economy, uh, data-driven technologies, so on and so forth. So, so that's my home. Um, I'm hoping that the colleagues will get back to it as soon as possible. Um, the, and I have to do credit for this. Uh, the credit, you don't often get credit screens at the start, do you? But really, everything you're about to see is done in collaboration with all these wonderful people. And maybe the takeaway is that, look, everyone's coming from different perspectives. And um, design informatics is very, very multidisciplinary, um, plural and open minded. So but just I thought I would just look back at some of the things. Oops, it is. I've done in the past because in some ways referencing concepts of archive my when i arrived in edinburgh i was very lucky to lead a grant with colleagues from a bunch of universities in the uk that dealt with tagging objects and putting them into an early internet of things um tales of things electronic memory um so here we're literally asking people to tell a story about an object they cared deeply about that allowed us to stand up a, a platform. We got a large grant, expert grant, um, and then literally built tales of things. I think if you go and Google it now, it's probably fallen apart. But at the time, it, it really caught um, a moment when we saw databases become smart to some extent, searchable, public, open after Web.2.0. And it made thinking about what the things in our lives valued, how might we put them into archives? And people would tell us the most extraordinary stories, um, including Annie. Hi, I'm Annie Lennox, and I'm donating this rather interesting, fabulous, unique dress, which I actually wore to a rather splendid occasion, which happened to be Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday party at Hyde Park in London. So if you buy this and wear it, that's what you can tell your friends. And um, Annie helped us promote it through Oxfam and Oxfam actually released an app which allowed the public to tag things before they went into the um, to the Oxfam shops. And in the end, whoops, the sound, sorry. And then we followed up with a, a small show at the uh, National Museum of Scotland where, again, familiar objects um, were added. Interestingly, we had uh, ghost objects here, so blanked out uh, things that people might recognise, such as a, um, a dial, a rotary dial telephone. And the, the stickies are actually QR codes which indicate someone's written a story onto that object. And then upstairs, the objects, the real objects, if you like, which um, have particular provenance, then people could access those stories or actually keep writing stories onto them. So there's the, the telephone and the ghost telephone was downstairs. So we've always been interested in the, in the movement of data, knowledge, um, the flow of that, that the study of informatics actually is the study of the flow of uh, information. So we've always been interested in this. If I jump then to the present, that's 10 years old. And what I wanted to try to talk to, do, to you today about is how then as designers, we've found ways to frame this activity, which was quite nascent, emergent for me, certainly at the time, 10, 12 years ago, into a type of methodology. Um, and really, the methodology still is all about value. Tales of Things was all about value, really, and try to managing the values that people associate with consumer artifacts, homemade artifacts, but thinking about where the value creation occurred. And Tales of Things really was a value creation moment, allowing other people to own the narratives, not just the museum or perhaps the, the manufacturer. So I'm just going to do a quick overview of how I think this has changed. Many of us, I think, still, if we were born through the late 20th century, have an imaginary, an economic imaginary, which is dominated through the production of value in a particularly push model. So these arrows here indicate um, Volkswagen, uh, Kellogg's, Heinz, 
the BBC even, who push value at us um, and through huge broadcasting technologies. Now, as soon as the internet comes along, you begin to get a push back. And we talk about a push and a pull economy. And you might think of the first internet was very push. Web.20 was push and pull. I could start writing into blogs. I could even have my own blog. Um, as we move through, and I think as we find we're going to move to Web3, and we can talk about that later, we're going to try to disempower Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon to begin to think about who has the power to push value at us and how is it co-created. So we don't talk about push and pull anymore. We actually think about transgressions. These arrows are supposed to meant how on earth do you represent uh, people downloading Game of Thrones without actually paying for it? People um, yeah, taking images off internets before NFTs came along. We're in a quite a wild state at the moment where we're hoping the platforms don't control all of our activities. Otherwise, they will control the means of value creation. In the end, I ended up leaning into Stefan Michel's idea of value constellations, that in the end, we're all in networks, complicated networks in which users, it's an awkward word, that one, but consumers, people, um, are trying to co-create value with what they see out in the world. And the supplier might be you tweeting. It might be Amazon um, offering a certain product, but nevertheless, we know that it's not a binary relationship, that all of us are caught up in very complicated networks where the value proposition, the place of co-creation is subject to algorithms, it's subject to uh, social media perspectives, it's subject to reports on how the value of something is good technically or good ethically or whether it's a fair trade. So we know we're caught up in increasingly complicated networks. When I show the slide though, there is an assumption that those circles might be human. And of course, many of them are actually forms of AI, uh, machine learning, trying to find profile us, um, offer us adverts, offer us ways in to identify what we really, really want. So I suppose this is an over, a meta slide thinking about and maybe asking you all, what is your library doing? What is your archive doing to create value in a digital economy? How do you see yourselves networked? How do you see yourselves moving value and allowing people to co-create it in different ways? Of course, all of your work to some extent is a bit leaky. Much of my work is. In other words, I can't actually contain it. And that's why you begin to see Web3 and NFTs come along trying. <laughs> we'll find out if they fail miserably. But beginning to contain because much data in archives can leak. And we've all got stories where we decided to upload to Flickr and then quickly pull things off or whether we do license things openly or whether we try to make things proprietary and find ways to build or retain some of the value ourselves. And there's lots of models that have failed and lots of examples, I'm sure, that have succeeded. But I suppose casting everything we do, it's very hard to hang on to data these days. So if you think that, and I do, that value, that data does represent and co-creates aspects of value in the digital economy, it's hard to think how it doesn't, it might be possible to suggest that our primary representation of value has shifted from money in the 20th century to data. All those things that we bought through Kellogg's, Heinz, Volkswagen, whatever, Apple, actually, yes, they had a price tag on them and they had value chains. But now if we think about a network proposition, actually value is co-created in many different ways because of the flow of data. And critically, I think things that we're interested in is if it does change and move away from an economic perspective, does it allow us to change the values that you can represent? So let's dive in because what John Oberlander and I, and uh, my best pal, unfortunately died back in 2017. But before he did, we wrote this little manifesto for my own students, our own students and the master's programme and also the group, which talked about how do we help the designers begin to think about working with data? And um, John, being a literary kind of guy, picked up on the ablative framework, which actually is a reverse, I think. I think it's by, with, from. But we flipped it because it made sense when we thought about how our students were starting to use data in different ways. So really briefly designed from data is when we go out into the world and extract things and bring them back. 
with data, you'll find that we're in amongst uh, live real-time flows of data. And then the last one by data preempts this idea that maybe data itself has a propensity to, to come up with ideas on its own, to begin to, to extend that more than, more than human idea. But let's dive in. And I think I'm hoping these three lenses allow you not just to see the nature of our research, but maybe ask questions around how you value data and how you want to work with people. So the first one, when systems are designed by people, when they're inspired by measurable features of humans, computers, things and their contexts, design from data. Now, the from data piece is very much thinking about we go, we go out into the world virtually on our feet and we take things back to our studios. And I'm going to use this as just a couple of examples. We've been fascinated in the way that data is starting to have forms of economic value through Bitcoin and smart contracts. Whether we worry about the money or not, nevertheless, people are starting to construct smart contracts to manage the flow of information and then release certain powers. This is an old PwC slide, which is a little bit dubious because it implies right in the middle there that a smart contract might operate between, um, well, I like the, the key one, the landlord remotely locks out a tenant because they haven't paid. And that's a smart contract. But anyway, that's the context. When we design by data, then some things we do is build something. It's a real, it's a prototype. It's not supposed to be a manufactured object and it allows people to interact with it. And then we interview them afterwards. So things go out into the world and then we listen to them and we, we take from them. We take their experiences. So this is quite a playful one. We built a, a Bitcoin coffee machine. Um, and here you'll see Rory, the developer, he just wants a coffee. But we would give this to groups of people and interview them afterwards about how they felt. And here you can see he's offered lots of coffees, but actually what he wants to know, and the machine wants him to take an ethical vote on which coffee beans the machine should buy next. And it could be best price, which is what he clicked on, um, which is, isn't very appropriate, um, or from a social resource community um, or from a um, environmental. And you can see actually the community that was in voted for a social responsi responsible coffee bean for the machine because it's got its own Bitcoin wallet to buy next. So the from element comes is then when we go and listen and pursue, pursue interviews and bring that information back to them write papers on. Another example, again, we're designers. Uh, we designed with members of the EU community to think about what the implication of these types of Bitcoin um, smart contracting technologies do. This is how many people imagine energy is managed in the UK. I don't know about other countries, but we have this balancing problem that there's only so much energy from all the power stations. And there's a team who has to balance that energy so that at um, eight o'clock tonight, when we're all sitting down watching Netflix, or we have a break and have a cup of tea, that we can manage the energy needed to turn all those kettles on. The idea being really through the EU is how could we decentralize that? How could we ask the public to take responsibility for managing their own energy? So like the Bit Barista, we develop three prototypes that we put out in the world. They don't really work. Well, they work just enough to perform a theatre with people so that we can then interview them to see how they felt about the speculative possible future of managing data um, and, and energy. So in this one, Sean is wants his hair dried, but actually what he's doing, he's going to get up at four in the morning, buy some cheap energy and then sell it um, to Anna at seven o'clock on a Friday evening when she's prepared because of an emergency date to go and um, pay the top price for it. So actually the hairdryer for Sean is actually a way of making his way through university and actually getting free hair dried. So he is balancing the grid, if you like, because he's getting up late and making sure he can store local energy. The second one says that Sean actually struggles with getting up at four in the morning. So he's written a little bot that sits on top of this hairdryer and it can, he can code it with the values that he wants. So actually he does want green energy. So he sets the smart contract running. It can't deliver him instant energy. What it does, it then negotiates with the internet and finds green energy. But that might take 10 minutes, folks. And our question to you would be, um, and with, with participants was, how long would you take for certain actions if you could 
drive a value proposition toward your values, whether they're green values, for example, social values. How long are you prepared to wait? And what does that mean for the implication of changing who has power in these centralized networks? The last one actually took away all the buttons because we don't believe anyone would do any of this. We just think um, you're all heading for 1.5 degrees plus um, and actually you all want beautiful looking hair. So we took the buttons away. And in this one, it's a provocation. Perhaps it's the most designed by data artifact because it says that, well, the systems themselves will balance out the energy according to the planet and you might have to wait half an hour to blow dry your hair so you won't even get the button. So. What we do then, and I'm just going to scamper through these, we throw these prototypes into the world and we ask people literally to speculate how they would use them. And in this instance, we happen to use some Hi. local actors and they played out what people had said. For example, this is a, an actor. Um, she's just going to plug in her one of the hair dryers in someone else's house to make money, and which was a kind of a, a breach. It transgresses the idea that this person walks into your library and starts making money from your energy feed. And they fit, the others are, are, were, were upset by this idea. The second one uh, speculates this idea, well, it's, it's entirely autonomous, and therefore it's a bit like living with a cat who has its own inclination. It will do its own things, but it will try to make value for the family. The last one is more around this idea of an invisible flatmate, that they're not quite sure who is doing what in the house anymore. So this is how we design from. We put things in the world, we listen to how they land, and we take that back and write up papers about what that means for the next steps. Now that's all very good. And some of the big questions I'm gonna ask you folks is, how do you then co-create value in your digital economies? How do archives do that? Right, scampering on, design with data, tries to take away the idea that we extract from the world when systems, yes, are still designed by people, when they take into account the flows of data through systems and the need to make data manifest, particularly reduce its obfuscation. And the critical thing here is the flows of data. So we find examples of real time value creation because value is flowing around and data is flowing around and we're caught up, we're entangled in it, which is very different to giving someone an object and then interviewing them. So in this example, um, just turn this quiet. Um, these are about 50 cash cups. They're little ceramic cups designed by Katie West, who's a Scottish ceramicist. Um, we take them out to we took them out to the Netherlands. Um, what's about to happen though is that every coffee cup you could just about see has got a, a colour on the bottom. That's a radio frequency identifier that allows this this little base to know who they are, who owns it and um, how much value it's got with it. So what happens here is if I put a cash cup on the saucer and it hasn't got any credit, then I'll get a red circle. And I can't spend it at the barista. I'll show you in a minute. However, if I put two red cups on, they suddenly both turn green, which means I can then confirm that my coffee cup, because they've got numbers, has got credit. So it's anonymized, you don't actually know who you are, you've got a certain coffee cup. It means I can take my now green coffee cup and go over to the barista and I got a free coffee. Now this is the fun bit, because actually what we're really doing then is constructing value, because these people have never met before. Um, they're really happy to meet, but we're forcing them into a social engagement in which ask them, they, they need to connect to each other to get each other some credit. Um, and all of those people then went off and, um, and exchanged for coffee. And the conversation was incredibly rich, that the service of these artifacts is around conversation. Conversely, um, and we had a huge queue in this, um, very, very popular and a great barista adding value. The queue was huge. Just through the doors at the back there, there's free coffee completely free coffee, but it's from a plunge device, one of those portable kettles. And so few people wanted it because the role of the coffee cup was to co-create conversation. Um, okay, on to my second example. Again, we tied people up into the nets of, of, of information there. This is another one where we really wanted to put people in the middle of an entangled relationship with the flows of data. Um, just to set the scene, um, because I'm going to show you an app in a moment. Um, this is Jonathan. He's demonstrating what a smart contract is here. He's put a pound in that little cog in the middle and he's pressed the 
the button there on the right. If in the next five minutes there is an earthquake anywhere on the planet, that one pound coin will turn to the right and will give the money to Oxfam's emergency response fund. If there isn't an earthquake in the next five minutes, then the cog will turn to the left and you'll get your money back. So it's a very simple idea of trying to connect people who are very disconnected in the Oxfam value chain about how they're giving money, they're maybe donating clothes. How do you connect them to the, the live actions, um, environmental, political, that that means we have charities, global charities existing. So this is the final thing. This was um, released in Australia. Uh, this is the first release and actually it's going out again um, in the spring actually this year. So what's going to happen here is uh, it's an app and I'm just going to show you how it works. We're going to dive into the earthquake insurance. This person is now going to set up a conditional contract. So in this study we gave um, Australians, we gave them 10 bucks each. So we gave them 10 Australian dollars and we put it into this escrow on the blockchain. And this person is choosing that if there is an earthquake over 3.5 on the Richter scale in those continents, and actually they're prepared to spend $5 of their complete fund, which we've given them, so it's not their money. Um, but on every instance of, a, um, of an earthquake, they'll give out 50 cents and they'll do it over three or four days. So they've set up a conditional relationship with the earth and a conditional relationship with a validated uh, party, which happens to be the, the American Geological Association who report. They've got pretty reliable data on earthquakes. And in this way, if we now look on the right, that contract has been signed on the blockchain. Um, and in this instance here, um, I can see the earthquake insurance was created. You get a cooling off period actually with smart contracts. Um, it's kind of an aspect, a characteristic of blockchain. But here we're beginning to find out that the report, so here we saw the contract was signed and we also know that it was sealed. They couldn't back out, Oxfam couldn't get out of it. But every blue one is an example when an earthquake has taken place. And I could pause it just to say that, look, there's an earthquake of 4.8 in the Philippines and out travels the money. So they can't, can, they can't go back on this. They can't welch on the deal. They're just, and they run out. And if, it, if your earthquake um, is too low, then trust me, there's earthquakes happening all of the time. So this is, again, designing with data, trying to place people in a context, an entanglement with data in the world. So it, and it has, it's deeply affective, actually. Some people felt it was too affective, that they didn't realize earthquakes were taking place all the time. Um, on the other hand, it turned into a news feed for some people because they found that uh, the Australian news was dominated by particular issues. The last um, area then is designing by data when systems are designed by other systems. So we're talking about data itself having agency to essentially work autonomously where new products and services can be synthesized via the data intensive analysis, analysis of existing combinations and humans are demoted into a rather flat platform here. And just a couple of examples, and I'm curious about, again, how your archives might design by data themselves. So this is Martin, this isn't my work at all. We commissioned it through Design Informatics and Creative Informatics, a large grant. But I thought it was wonderful because um, what he does is essentially, he's very worried about Zoom and he feels that Zoom is taking my face now. And, and actually no one knows where it's going. So he built a little application that runs as a, as a camera that I can plug into Zoom and literally show a face of myself, but it has an uncanny resemblance to me or to him in this case, but also to some of the image libraries that talk about a white male with dark hair with a mustache slash beard. So you begin to get this averaging and his friends recognize him but on the other hand, there's an uncanny sense of being obfuscated. So it's highly likely that Zoom can't sell his face on, even though people in his network recognize him. And this, folks, is what he did to me. So that's me on the left. Um, and that's my that was my Zoom avatar. It was a way that actually designing by data, the algorithm was assisting me in thinking about how I preserve some of my identity, assuming that we're not still not sure what Zoom do with our data. And the last example really is really trying to rethink what happens when we let go. This is a particular design question is, 
um, and this was posited back in 2014, um, that maybe by 2017, a significant di disruptive digital business will be launched that was conceived by a computer algorithm and startups are probably going to be led by algorithms, not by humans. Well, that was the proposition. Um, we were interested because it might suggest that as designers for the 20th century, we had superstar designers, Johnny Ive, Zaha Hadid, um, Thomas Heatherwick at the top of the pyramid. Then we start to recognize the value of participatory um, working and the crowd. Much of us work in a co-design model now. But what happens if we just asked things to design for us? Is it that all of the chairs that you're all sitting on, if they could talk to each other, perhaps they would tell us what would be better for them, for us and the planet. And that would be, again, a design by data idea. So in a little example, this is um, designed by people. 854 people work collaboratively, nothing to do with me, but it's quite a cool idea. Work to design and co-design um, these extension cables. But if you could imagine all the extension cables in Europe were linked up to each other, what would they tell us about the crazy things humans get up to and how might they then mitigate against that rather than selling us value according to certain market competition how might things guide us so an example might be this particular thing and we the idea is to demonstrate how the machine learning might work here so forgive my um crude story this thing doesn't know what it is folks hasn't a Scooby-Doo. All it knows is it goes to, it, go, it gets up in the morning, um, it is particularly busy in the evening, and late at night it has a shower, huge shower, um, with some of its friends. We found out that its friends, one is very curvaceous and one is very sharp. And then after a period of time, by, by looking at, at, at the data sets and what these things do across the entire internet, it figures out that maybe it's a fork. Um, which is quite interesting, this idea that things find themselves and they find their purposes. Having said that, this particular thing is confused because someone in the household keeps using it to open tin paint, uh, paint cans um, and they use it to lever them open. So periodically, it's also becoming a screwdriver. So we set out um, on a, a, a piece of work with um, team in Tokyo and also in the Netherlands, beginning to look at what happens when things could begin to show us other ways of working. So we did a whole bunch of machine learning, particularly looking at image use of forks, believe it or not. And we found that, yes, there's lots of examples that many of you perhaps don't realize because you're obsessed with forks being good for one thing. Actually, forks are great for tying bows. Who knew? They're great for gardening. Um, in terms of hybridization, there's lots of ways that the things, if we ask them, might ask them to be associated with other activities or objects to hybridize them. We also found evidence where they were partially hybridized with other artifacts, where forks then become part of another desirable property to make something new, or they're just plain repurposed. Um, so again, we and the, the funding ran out on this one, um, but the idea was that it led to the proposition. And I just want to finish perhaps with the some of the actual work that came out, which informed a bunch of papers around thing ethnography. Ethnography tends to imply that we use working with humans. And um, many ethnographers have turned to these kind of cameras that they hang on participants to capture where humans go in the daytime. But actually, we started to put them on objects to listen to their side of the story. So in this little video, what you're seeing is you're seeing a human view. You're also seeing a fridge view and you're also seeing a kettle view. And it was really fun. It, it tells us lots of stories. It turned out, and I don't think we knew this from the human, that there's a love affair going on between in this particular household. It turns out that both of the humans have a particular favorite cup and they keep going to this cup. They didn't know, they don't mind if the cup's not available, but they both gravitate to one cup. And it was the cup that told us that the humans prefer it than perhaps um, any other type of cup. So to close off, I wonder how you might think about how we do collect data from the world, how we stay in the world and design with it, and then how we might begin to start trusting, if we can trust some of the AI, the machine learning, the data-driven technologies that begin to provoke more than human perspectives. And I just encourage you to keep thinking in a network. You will have value for your archive because you allow people to co-create its value. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if I ran over at all, Anna, so I'm just going to stop sharing it and see if I can click there. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you so much.
Phew. So we open up the, the floor to questions from, um, from our participants. If you have any, please do put them into the, the Q&A or feel free to, to raise your hand and you can join us in our kind of uh, virtual space here. Um, and while you're, while you're busy kind of thinking, if it's okay, I will start with a question for you, um, Chris. So I was really interested in um, whether you could say just a little bit more about how you think that kind of framework of uh, designing from, with, and by data might be applied to, to either kind of how we're thinking about service design or the data that we're collecting around our kind of users and our collections, or actually the objects that, um, that we might hold within our, our special collections or archives or museums for some of us. Yeah, sure. Well, a, a few thought, I suppose the key thing for me and the team is this idea of boosting agency. How do we let more stories um, come forward or how do we allow the power to be spread so that more people feel that they can come forward? There's a real challenge. I think we know all of us will know that not everyone comes forward. Um, not everyone feels that they have voice. In fact, we know that our archives um, probably need to go through some level of decolonization and we need to flatten some of the, the power bases that um, frame the archives, represent certain people and misrepresent others or don't represent them at all. So I suppose leaning into the, the ablative framework, it might is it possible then that if we um, skip the from, because that's us going into the world to do the collecting, assuming that we have biases, either we have to extend um, our, our network to make sure more people are represented or they're more diverse, other histories come forward, or if it's with, how, how can we design with, what, with the archives that we have already? Is it that we're looking for absence? Um, how, do we follow, how do we follow their use, their adoption? Um, and again, are they leaning towards certain priorities or dominant parties? And finally, with the buy, how might um, a loyal AI, if you like, begin to identify what we, what we are missing? How do we lean into a more than human or a, perhaps a, um, a plural approach to understanding the limitations of particular archives? How might an archive, an AI in an archive, begin to link through to build different constellations across archives that then give different uh, futures, different, or sorry, different reflections of the past so that we can talk about futures in different ways. So I, I, th I still think they're quite useful lenses. <laughs> I don't know if they work with this audience. <laughs> oh, I, I think so. And we've got um, a question which I, we, uh, has come through, um, which I think kind of picks up that, that topic. So um, from Angus, who's asked, um, says one of your examples made him wonder about the factual, non-factual connotations of data and whether design by deception is something archives need to be concerned about. It's a great, really interesting question, Angus. I look, I'm a art. I did fine art, so I'm really, and I moved into design because it's a place. Where perhaps I think more co-creation takes place. Artists like to do their thing, and we like probably them to do their thing. But I do like transgressive moments. So I do. I I really enjoy the idea that um, that technology might, if we're not careful, represent certain normalized practices, which then some fall under some jurisdiction of what's right and what's wrong. And I think I, th I would much prefer an archive that showed us um, transgressions, um, movements away, pushing against certain hegemonies, if you like. So um, design by deception sounds thrilling. <laughs> it sounds like a course I need to run instantly for my undergrads, let alone my postgrads. In fact, we ran a um, we really upset the product design students a few years ago by asking them to design for shoplifting. And some of them really found it distressing because they didn't want to lean into something that was potentially um, going to put themselves or other communities in an exposed position. But we kept it very safe within the academy. But it did allow us to think about who owns what's right or what's wrong. Who owns, is it, are we privileged in knowing that um, certain, I mean, is it, do we all think that you have all got Netflix, the BBC, Apple, um, Prime, and Disney, and probably countless others. My hunch is we don't. I think my hunch is that we assume many of you still end up with illegal copies by hook or by crook or by sons or by daughters. And actually, it's probably about time that we talked not about deception, about how certain economies get away 
being part of a social conversation. If we if we cut people out from the conversation because they're not allowed or they can't afford to get in, then I'm not sure we can have a public debate about things. So I like the deception or I like the opportunity to frame things. I think the question there is who decides what is deceptive or what is deceitful? Because I hope it's not um, a police position. Someone's going to be the policing. And I, uh, yeah, I much prefer not to think in that. So yeah, let's let's lean into design by deception. Thank you so well, thanks, thank you very much. You. <laughs> so we again just a kind of we welcome people to kind of raise their hands if they'd like to ask uh, Chris a question or to pop something into the chat. Um sorry, the question and answer uh function as opposed to the chat. Um and uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to ask, um, so I'm really interested in that kind of point of creation um, that you've talked about. And I wondered what you thought kind of more generally the role of the library was within a kind of tech ecosystem. So um, how, how might we be more involved? And we're kind of really interested in student innovation and how we kind of um, encourage creativity within our, our um, universities. And what do you think that kind of the value might be for us in helping people think about those kind of startups and scale ups. Yeah, I want, I, that's a great question. I wonder whether you and the community see themselves. I mean, the, we know, I mean, uh, perhaps we need to acknowledge the West Coast imaginary around startups as being problematic. So let, let's just put that out there already that the hacker, the hustler, the hipster, and the archivist, the librarian. At what point um, does the community? have a stake because it would strike me as vital absolutely vital because if, if we pursue a trajectory that the startup um team is somehow born out of maybe if it's born in the academy it's about uh, students working together around a postdoc project or a master's pro and they're building up steam they find their economic business model and then they drive down the tech they get in a hipster to make it look cool and human-centered but where where was the archives and I do think there's a, tr I wonder whether there's a tremendous opportunity for thinking about how we enter these, and the, the community call them funnels. Where is the role in the funnel towards scaling up a sense of addressing um, the digital humanities, if that's the right frame? And I can't believe there isn't. And I wonder what, I hope this doesn't sound terrible, but what would a we work, because I'm not a great fan of we work, or one of those um, hired spaces where you can hot desk. Um, what would they be doing if they were in a library or an archive? How might that change the nature of the products and services that they produce? They're all largely data driven, but to what extent are their databases ill informed because of the things this particular community could bring to bear around biases, sensitivities, representation? Sometimes you're, you're super good at obfuscating to allow different stories to come forward, um, even ontologically putting things together in certain ways. So, I, yeah, it strikes me as a missing opportunity, and I don't hear many communities, maybe there's something RLUK could ask mm -hmm. and go straight and ask. I mean, we, Edinburgh, we've got code bases. Um, um, there's, of course, there's places, lots of places like in London, um, startup communities. What about the role of existing archives? And I also, having said that, I also don't want to muddy um, or sully any of your <laughs> integrity, because you might think, no way we're not going near that but on the other hand there's a moment of innovation perhaps that both parties might mutually benefit from um, mm. yeah for sure okay we've um while we've been talking another question has come in um so from rosie she asked the types of design from with by data you describe are really exciting how do we balance these possibilities with environmental concerns especially with regards to blockchains and nfts Great. Yeah. Great question, Rosie. We, so we do, so we go in um, and this is a, I don't know how you feel about this, but so we go in, we work with the blockchain developers. Um, we'll take the ethical stance that we'll only spin up and work with blockchains that do um, are environmentally conscious. So the way that certain blockchains work changes how much energy they use according to how they prove the cryptography in a crude sense. Um, and the proof of work ones are really wicked. They're just the Bitcoin one, particularly wicked. There are plenty of others that actually um, look at collaboration to prove um, that evidence or transactions 
are fair. So actually, there's lots of cooperative and social models in which we can think about a distributed approach to if you think about this distributed ledger, how do we prove that the ledger is correct? Um, and mining is a particularly heavy one for Bitcoin. But I promise there's lots of other ones. Um, I think that the question is, if I zoom out a little bit, I think we're going to have to talk about the environmental benefits of decentralizing and taking responsibility um, for energy for consumption of data, so on and so forth. I, I think that's probably going to happen because I don't, unfortunately I'm reading Ministry for the Future, which is a really bleak short-term science fiction about actually the governments won't get their act together. The corporations won't get their act together. So I have a, a tendency to lean into decentralized opportunities in which technology can bind and empower people to make informed decisions. But you're absolutely right. We need to do it in such a way that does does not exacerbate or extend on nfts i think i think what's fascinating because really the jury is out is that how do we find ways to talk about ownership after the 20th century though because i i do think i'm surrounded by artifacts which other people can't get to and maybe libraries feel like that so thinking about how we have a way of opening up more probably does mean we need ways to track some objects there's so many objects and things in the world which just go into a landfill <laughs> simply because we can't follow the data. So I wouldn't, I think the NFTs things is interesting because you could begin to follow the data and then not hold people to account, but begin to allow other people to borrow that artifact without a registry. It's very hard to imagine, but hey, I'm making this up to be honest, Rosie. So good question. And we do what we can. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um... Could I ask uh, just what your next project is? What's the next? Because you've done some such interesting work. Um, and what yeah, sure. coming down the line that, that we would maybe have a sneak preview of? Yeah, and I really, so, okay, I've tried this on my wife and my daughter and they think it's silly. But when we did the, um, the earthquake, we built a number of what we call those seesaws. They're smart contract, physical smart contract devices. And one of them, was very, very simple. You could write in um, felt tip pen, a hashtag that you wanted, every time it was tweeted, money would pass to the, to the charity. So if you wrote down um, something about lifeboats or RNLI, every time someone tweeted, money literally moved through that central cog onto the RNLI. And okay. actually the RNLI uh, tweet, every time a lifeboat goes out, they tweet. So we just put money into this big well and um, money was then passed over. And it was great. It's very good, very visual. Now, what I've been doing recently is hijacking that same tool and I'm trying to wash money. But usually when we talk about washing money, it's actually washing badness out of money. So I have some money that's perhaps been caught up in a, a mafia imaginary and I need to move it through the University of Edinburgh and it will wash, it will launder the money and clean it out. Well, I wonder if we could start laundering money with values that we care about. So the idea now is to, to build a, a similar artifact and I ask you to give me, Anna, five pounds. So I have an iZettle and I'm going to take five pounds out of your bank account but what I'm going to do is when someone tweets on an issue that you care about, Black Lives Matter, through Libraries Forever, um, through whatever it is, then I'll give you your five pounds back. And I want you to know that that five pounds should be spent. It should be thought about because your bank account is the biggest data set you have about your lifestyle. And it's also potentially, given pensions, your most powerful artifact to move change. So I'm going to so folks, if that makes sense, I'm going to I want to take five pounds off each of you now and I'm going to wash it with good values, values that you think that, that money should be operating as in the future. So that's the current work, Anna. How do I <laughs> how do I reverse laundering yeah. into a good practice? <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. I think there's so many opportunities here for us um, when we're thinking about the work we do had to be much more imaginative around the data that we that we have and are collecting um, and those interactions as well 
Um, I'm just going to open up the floor to see if anybody has any final questions for for Chris. And and, and I must admit, um, if in doubt, get a resident, res an artist in residence. If in doubt, we yeah. had Martin Disley who did the work with the um, with the AI, the doppelgangers. Um, he won a small grant to go and work in the National Library of Scotland, and was just fantastic. Um, the, the curator allowed him deep into some image files, databases, and he wrote an AI to then start pulling things up. Um, one of the tactics was to push any images from um, the two big bridges, the Tay Bridge and the Fourth Bridge, into um, a combined generative adversarial network. So you had these odd images and the public's, that's not the Fourth Road Bridge. It's, it's seared into my memory, the fourth rail bridge. That isn't it. And it wasn't it. It was a combination. And trickily, it was also a combination of the Tay rail disaster. But what was fascinating, people stood up and took notice. And there was a conversation started to take place because these images were brought out of the archive. And it's though the archive was speaking, saying, I'm still here. I want your attention. And I want you to look at this human. Um, so, yeah, if in any doubt, folks, get a designer or an artist in residence and... Um, they'll get creative. I'm sure you're very creative, though. <laughs> yeah, and that idea of giving our um, our objects or our materials that their own agency to speak um, for themselves yeah. without our without our values laid in across them is just fascinating. Really. I, I, you might speculate, because if, if we put an object in the archive with our biases and we didn't put the other object in, how might we help that one object to then go and learn what it's friend might be so how would you get an object that is in an archive to go and look for something that is equivalent or mm. it's friend how do you how do you build things so because of course they're, they're all loaded with biases you know, the way that we put them in in the first place so um we don't want to extend those biases what we want to do is pluralize the opportunity for that object to be connected to other cultures 